Did you know that there are some types of dementia that can be reversible? You mean like Alzheimer's? Not exactly Alzheimer's, but there are some types of dementia that can be confused as Alzheimer's, but they're actually something else. September is Hydrocephalus Awareness Month, so I wanna to talk to you about a condition that's commonly misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's, but it's not, and it has a cure. It's called normal pressure hydrocephalus, and it's more common than you think. Yesterday, I presented the case of a 68-year-old woman who came to my office with complaints of memory trouble. She's had this problem over the past few years, but her family was thinking that she was just depressed. She was acting more retracted, her mood had changed, and she just became disinterested in the things that she used to like. They took her to see psychiatry, she was put on an antidepressant, but the problem just got worse, and they noticed that she started having trouble with her walking and her balance. There are some types of conditions that are neurological and have pretty classic patterns of gait, and normal pressure hydrocephalus is one of them. It's a pretty common problem that we see. It's called a shuffling gait pattern where they'll walk with short steps and their feet are almost acting like they're stuck to the ground. We will also call this the magnetic gait. It's actually incredibly rewarding when I can make a diagnosis just by watching a patient walk down the hallway as they enter the exam room. And that's why I think it's so incredibly important for physicians to do a thorough physical examination and just pay attention and be present during the visit. Here's the CT scan of her brain that was performed that showed significantly enlarged ventricles or the fluid spaces of the brain. In cases of hydrocephalus, when an MRI of the brain is performed, you can often see what we call transependymal flow, which are these white caps around all the ventricular spaces. And what that essentially is, is where pressure buildup in the ventricles will push fluid out into the brain and cause these changes on imaging. We classically teach normal pressure hydrocephalus as the diagnosis of the three W's, wet, wobbly, and wacky. Wet means that the patient may be demonstrating signs of urinary incontinence, and you need to ask about this because some patients may find this embarrassing to talk about. So you may have to specifically ask the patient if they've been having to use pads for incontinence. Wobbly means that the patient is starting to have balance troubles or trouble with their walking, similar to the magnetic gait that I described earlier. Wacky simply means cognitive changes such as increased forgetfulness or confusion. Symptoms typically progress over a period of three to six months, like in our patient's case, and in 50 to 75% of cases, they will demonstrate all three of those Ws. So just remember, not all of those symptoms can be present with this particular diagnosis. NPH is a poorly understood diagnosis and often goes misdiagnosed. It typically affects people over the age of 60. A lot of cases are simply diagnosed as Alzheimer's. That's why it's so important to get imaging on any patient that's diagnosed with dementia, particularly if they're young, like in our case. Hydrocephalus can be a result of stroke or brain tumor, but in most cases, we don't really know why it happens. In fact, less than 20% of patients with this problem are properly diagnosed. But remember, not all patients will demonstrate all three symptoms. The ventricular system in our brain is where the spinal fluid is produced and circulates around our brain, deliver nutrients and get rid of waste. It circulates around the brain in a pattern much like this and then will go down around the base of the brain and the brainstem, circulate down through the spinal cord and then be reabsorbed. Hydrocephalus is where that fluid pressure can build up and cause increased pressure inside of the skull. There are several different types of hydrocephalus. One is called obstructive hydrocephalus, where any point around this fluid channel, there can be something that can obstruct the flow of fluid and cause the backup of pressure. In normal pressure hydrocephalus, it has its name because when we measure the intracranial pressures, it's actually normal. So how can that happen? We think it has to do with the circulation of the spinal fluid and it doesn't properly circulate and you can get a slight backup of fluid within the brain. If the CSF keeps accumulating, it has nowhere to go and can cause excess pressure on the surrounding brain tissue. That is what's causing the symptoms of the three W's. So how do we diagnose it? I mentioned doing a thorough neurological and physical examination on the patient, which is incredibly important. 
Asking the patient's medical history and their symptoms can help lead you to make that diagnosis and order appropriate imaging studies such as CT scans and MRIs. MRI is the most important tool that we have to utilize to help make this diagnosis. Remember, I said that the problem is an accumulation of excess fluid in the brain, but the pressure is actually normal. So we'll often perform a spinal tap to help measure the pressure and then drain some fluid off to see if the patient's symptoms improve. We often send them for what's called a large volume spinal tap, where we can insert a needle into their spine, draw off some fluid, and see an improvement in their symptoms. But those symptom improvement is usually short-lived because our body can reaccumulate CSF within 24 hours. Some surgeons or neurologists will also perform what's called a lumbar drain trial, where we can place a drain into the patient's spine and slowly draw off fluid over a few days and have them formally evaluated by physical therapy to see if their gait improves. Both of these tests are incredibly important to help see if shunting of the spinal fluid can be a surgery that may help the patient. The definitive surgical treatment is something called a ventricular peritoneal shunt, where we'll divert the flow of fluid from the brain into the abdomen. And here you can see where we place a tube within the ventricle of the brain, and it's connected via something called a valve right here that control how much fluid is drained off, and then tubing is placed under the skin and then drains into the peritoneum or the space that's surrounding the bowels where the body can naturally resorb that fluid. There are other types of shunts called ventricular atrial shunts where we can drain fluid from the brain into the heart, and then ventricular pleural shunts where we can drain the fluid from the brain into the pleura or the space where the lung is. Those two types of procedures are often reserved for patients that fail ventricular peritoneal shunting or have some sort of contraindication where we can't go into the abdomen. There is also some evidence that would support endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which is where we can perform a procedure that places a small hole at the base of the third ventricle to divert fluid through a different pathway than what's normally present within the brain. We often use that procedure in cases of obstructive hydrocephalus to divert the flow of fluid, but there is some evidence to support that it may actually work in normal pressure hydrocephalus. In my practice, I routinely will perform ventricular peritoneal shunting for patients with NPH. Back to the case. Our patient had a large volume spinal tap that was performed by our radiology department where they drained off approximately 60 cc's of spinal fluid and the patient in 24 to 48 hours had near complete resolution of her walking and was starting to function with her family pretty normally. Remember, your body naturally reproduces the spinal fluid, so those symptoms did come back, and we discussed ventricular peritoneal shunt. It's an hour-long procedure in which the patient can be discharged home the next day. She did great after this surgery. She had complete resolution of her incontinence, her memory troubles, and her walk over two years out from her surgery and is back to her normal life. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Remember, September is Hydrocephalus Awareness Month. Stay tuned next week, and I'll go through another case.